Welcome to the World of Horror Podcast with Mom and Mac. This is the podcast where we share our love of international horror. Everyone has their fears, but we are not afraid of subtitles. Before we get into it, fair warning, these discussions will include spoilers and language which may not be suitable for all listeners. Let's move on to our first segment, Mom and Mac Chat. Hi, Mac. How's it going? Hi, Mom. Uh, it's going well. Well, I just sent you this um, <laughs> this J-pop boy band I found yesterday or maybe two days ago. <laughs> I've just been like, they're called Psychic Fever. I've just been obsessed with them. I I love, I don't necessarily think K-pop and J-pop, the music sounds, nobody come for me. I don't think it always sounds great, but I do think when you watch the performers dance, like that's that's what it's all for. If there's mm-hmm. not a dance for the song, I don't need to hear it. Um, I w- I just want to watch these talented people dance. Yeah, it's really fun. Yeah, you sent me that one video temperature, and that was just like super fun. And yeah, it's nice because it's not something I ever really <laughs> seek out. <laughs> like there was a podcast I used to listen to, but they've they've um, shuttered it. Um, and Stacy Ponder, Stacy Ponder, is that her name? I always think of that that character on Doctor Who. What's her name? Emily Pond. Oh, Amy Pond. Amy Pond. Anyway, Stacy Ponder um, likes this K-pop group called Mama Moo, and I guess there's like uh, like lesbians in it, or it's all lesbians oh. or whatever. And I do actually like the music, um, but mm-hmm. the but the dancing is also just like <laughs> freaking amazing. You think about how much work goes into that. Like, I mean, I get kind of sad also when I think about K-pop and J-pop idols. Like, I feel like that, I guess it's kind of like worse than professional sports. Mm Because at least some people in professional sports, they get paid exorbitant amounts of money. So at least the fact that your life is that and your body's going through rigorous hell, you can say it's kind of worth it. But I don't think J-pop or K-pop people make that much money. Um, more money is made off of them than they make. And also you're putting your body through hell. That's your life. You can only do that. So it just, I'm, I feel like it's all, like, I'm like, how do they keep tricking people into, <laughs> into getting in these groups? Because every time something like an expose comes out, it's always the worst thing you've ever heard. Like these people's lives are just horrible. And like I, I, I get it's like maybe just wanting to be famous, but I'm like, if you're not even like getting rich or like having fun, what's the point? <laughs> well, you'd hope that they'd be having fun, but I'm looking at somebody. I'm like, there's no way somebody could have fun in this situation. Is it like, is it like after they're not famous anymore, or like while they are in the public it's both. eye? Like, I feel like being in the public eye. I, like when I was younger, I used like a little kid, I used to think I wanted to be famous. And now I know that I do not like, it's actually a fear. Like I would hate to be in some viral video against my will. And now I'm like that guy. Like whenever that happens to people, I'm like, that's a nightmare. Somebody's cursed them. <laughs> like it's not even for something cool, but you're just known as, oh, you're the guy that did that thing and mm-hmm. you've made no money off of it. At least if you could make money off of it, that's one thing. <laughs> right. It all comes back to money for me. Well, um, I mean, I think that's a good way of thinking about it. It's really difficult. I was talking to somebody who um, sometimes it's the way I think about things. Like, are you a one income family or a two income family? <laughs> <laughs> that's valid. And I think I've come to the conclusion way too fucking late that if you are a one income situation, you should not be a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh <laughs> yeah that is a bit too late <laughs> <laughs> i've made a grave error no i it's it it would be fine as a second income yeah <laughs> it's like it's like you know an accessory income <laughs> but i don't know anybody who just works their one job yeah and i'm on oh shoot is it tomorrow 
<laughs> no, I think I have one more week to get ready. Um, <laughs> in one more week, I will be teaching 10 classes. And oh my God, a, a full load is six. So it's just like, Jeez. that's too many fucking classes. That's too many. <gasps> and poor thing. So one of my jobs, I get paid very well to, for doing very little, which is nice. So like I got a double payday because of just like the way these classes kind of overlap. So I got a double payday like last Ooh. week and I was like, okay. <laughs> We're good. Yeah. But I'm also in this artist entrepreneur class over Zoom. And I'm not a professional artist, but there are a lot of professional artists in the class. And we were talking about how to price stuff. And I guess artists like notoriously like underprice their stuff. Mm -hmm. And we were looking at this case study of somebody who was barely breaking even. And then we were trying to figure out like how she could make a profit, you know, doing all this math and everything like that. And it was just like, oh, wow. Like if I, and I like, and the, and I hate, you know, I hate math. So I, they wanted us, to, they were giving us all these math problems and they would be like, okay, we'll give you like five minutes to work on this. And I'm like, yeah, five I'm minutes. like, I'm on, I'm on my phone. I'm not, I'm not doing math at like six or seven at night. It, I'm not doing <laughs> not math happening. probably at 9am, you know, but so I sent a text to Mr. C. I'm like, if I'm ever able to make a living with my art, I'm going to need a math guy. Like, do you want to be that? <laughs> guy you know yeah and he said i can and i will and i was like Aww. oh <laughs> okay good <laughs> so sweet. i sure can't i can't it makes my brain go all like wobbly i can't do it um yeah but anyway um that would be nice because like the case study we were looking at she had a full-time job and then she worked like i don't know how many hours say 10 hours a week on her art and mm. She wanted to get to the point where she was, you know, like you have to, I mean, you have to sell your stuff so that the time you took to make it pays off, you know, it'll be kind of good for me later. I can't really like put it into practice right now, but yeah, I've been thinking about money a whole lot and like, what am I doing? And like, like, you know. I <laughs> I have a friend who thinks I should take short-term disability because of the COVID. I don't know if I have long COVID, but mm -hmm. I'm just like so exhausted all the time. And yeah. I can think it's too soon to know if I have long COVID or whatever. But basically every day I <laughs> I struggle and I get out of bed and I go to work and then I come home like four or five hours later and I sleep for three hours and then I do a little work and then I sleep. And then mm. that cycle repeats and I haven't been able to do any art or really anything, you know, else. Yeah. And um, so she's like, could can you, you just take... be burnt out? Like, yeah, it could be. And it's winter. So there's probably like seasonal effective shit going on as well. But I'm like, she's like, can you take short term disability? I'm like, well, by the time I got that going, <laughs> I would, it would probably be this summer break anyway so like i just yeah. need to like get through you know the next nine weeks and then it'll be summer mm. you know but yeah it's rough so the whole point is uh be careful <laughs> <laughs> be careful about what? Well, first of all, don't live in the U.S. Probably, if you do live oh, in the U.S., I failed step one already. <laughs> I know. Then, um, get a high-paying job, and if you can't do that, then make sure you live <laughs> with somebody who you know you can combine your income with, because otherwise, um, it's rough out here. Yeah, yeah, I. I... I do feel like it's like hard to say privilege because I'm like, I, I've just been, I've been thinking about money a lot too, but communicating or I've been talking with Alan about it. I'm like, okay, stay with me. There are so many like levels of wealth that it's kind of mind boggling. Like if you think about, if I think about where I am, I'm like, well, if you had nothing, like literally nothing. And there are people, I'm just thinking of 
my let's just think of North Carolina. There are people in North Carolina who have nothing. I would be like the richest man, you know. I've got a house and a job and I can, you know, eat food every day. That is like it's scary how much more that is than nothing. But I am not rich, you know. It's like right. if I will be working every day, 5 days a week, tired, and people are now saying like, well, will millennials and Gen Z be able to retire? We don't know. So I have that on the horizon of like, hmm, maybe I'll be doing this every single day until I die. So it's like, I don't consider myself wealthy. I don't even make like six figures. You know, it's like, and then when you think about, okay, now you're a person who makes six figures, that's still a lot, but you're still so much under the richest people. Like the just levels of wealth are they just make you feel crazy because I'm like, I know I I like two things can be true. Like, I know I am very privileged and I'm not denying that. And I'm not denying the fact that there are people who have so much less. And that is like a bigger issue. That's the issue we need to fix. And at the same time, it's like, I'm also not like a rich, like, I don't feel rich. Like, you know, right. I'm put most of my money. It's a. I'm able to put any excess money I make is in savings because I'm just like, I just need to have something for like when I'm and you think about like, oh, if you just suddenly couldn't work tomorrow, what are you going to do? That keeps me up at night because I'm just like, would I just be fucked? Like, that's so scary. So money is scary. Yeah, money is money is scary. And also, I told this friend who thinks I should take short-term disability that um, I'm going to have to do some soul-searching this summer. But I always do. I'm always like, I got to find a way to quit my job, you know. <laughs> and then it's like, it's like, um, it's how people have more than one baby. You know, like you forget the mm. pain of like. <laughs> <laughs> Searching for a job. Well, right. But I mean, I forget the, I forget how much I hate my job. Oh, on the break. On the break. And then I actually like look for, and I do love the teaching part. Mm -hmm. I love that part. But I hate every other part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and know? those take longer. Or like the other parts. It's not as if it's like, well, you're mostly teaching, but you just have to do these other bad things like a little bit. It's like, no, that's like a huge aspect of it mm -hmm. too. Yeah. I mean, I kind of do. I think people are starting to be slightly nostalgic about COVID. Like, you know, it, certain things about it were kind of nice. And one of those things is I mostly taught, I mean, I taught online, but mm -hmm. you know, most of my job was like, you know, if I could keep my camera off if there was a Zoom meeting or, yeah. you, know, do you know what I mean? And, and that kind of stuff. And I don't know. Uh, but it's, um, yeah, I like the planning and I like the, I like all the stuff that goes with the teaching part, but I hate all the rest of the stuff. And so sometimes I'm like, well, if I could like make it so that I just taught online, maybe then I could mm. be like happy. But I think the downside of COVID for me was like, I had way too much like alone time, mm. you know? And um, even for an introvert, you know, it's too much. It gets to you. Yeah. I think hey. I've kind of, my brain's been kind of broken. Like I still haven't ever been as social as I was before COVID now. Like, like if I used to think about spending multiple nights at home and not hanging out with friends, I'd be like, aghast and now that's but now it's like maybe i can schedule in like one friend during the week i just feel too maybe this is always where my life was going to go but now that i've reached that point i can't really go back <laughs> i mean you i mean you live with somebody though i mean that is true and i forget about that i forget like that that's like when i i had some friends tell me like i just want like a hug from somebody and I was like that makes me so sad like I forgot that I am lucky that I can just be like hey come in here give me a hug yeah yeah and you know you have social to me like that I'm <laughs> I I I, <laughs> I don't know how to put this 
I get afraid that my lifestyle is going to have to end at some point, And I don't know how I would ever deal with that because I really mm. like being alone. The only part mm. I don't like is like when I was sick, like being alone, that that was very sad mm. and lonely. But fortunately, it was only like a very short term thing. But I mean, otherwise, I like being alone. I really do. I mean, I like being alone in my home. Yeah. Like, like your sanctuary. Of, yeah. Thinking of having to um, share. <sighs> Maybe I could do it, but it would be very tough. That's, you know? I feel like that's the other side of the dual income is like, yeah, it's dual. You have to, you, you, but for me, like, well, I've never lived alone, but I, anytime Alan comes home late and it's like dark and I'm at home alone, I'm like, I can't do this. I, I I don't think I could live alone. Oh, mm-hmm. and but I get to spend most of the daytime alone because I work from home. It's probably Alan who's like, "Man, I never get the house to myself." <laughs> but I give him a lot of I give him a lot of space. I don't like, think he has the same. You would know better than me, but I mean, I don't think he has as extreme a need as you do. But mm. maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Yeah, I think he does because. Sometimes he'll just be like, I'm going to go game in because we have like separate rooms that we can like offices and I just won't see him for like a few hours. Oh, OK. Well, that's good. But I but yeah, I, I think that's healthy. Oh, I do, too. I do, too. Yeah. I mean, I think with my beef, it's like very like we're both kind of weird. Like we've lived, both lived alone for so long that it's like. Yeah. Like one time I said, do you think we could ever live together? And he said, if we had a really big house. <laughs> well, you guys need to get adjacent houses. Like That was my dream when I was a kid. That was like a duplex. I think it's smart. I think so too. I just like, as soon as I learned what duplexes were, I was like, that's what I would want. That you get sick, be like, listen, now you're sleeping in my house. Like, <laughs> come over. I think yeah. that would be perfect. I do too. Yeah, I pitched it to your dad. He didn't go for it. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, should we get into these? Well, speaking of dads. Spe- oh, hi. Nice transition. So we saw this movie, I don't know, probably about the time that it came out, wouldn't you say? It came out in 2018. And we the watched years it. are hard for me now. I just know we saw it together. We did. We did. We saw it. You and me and Quinn watched it together, I think. Yeah. I really yeah. liked it. Yeah. And, and I liked wanted, it when I watched it again. Kind of wanted an excuse to watch it again. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this week our theme was innocence or loss of innocence. Mm-hmm. Not the the innocence is later. Our theme was loss of innocence. So, <laughs> what better movie than the Clove Hitch Killer? Um, brief plot summary from IMDb is: A picture perfect family is shattered when the work of a serial killer hits too close to home. I feel like American accents aren't good for the term like serial killer or horror. Our R's just don't work with these like horror <laughs> terms. <laughs> True. Horror horror terms. <laughs> um, it was directed by Duncan Skiles and written by Christopher Ford. It stars Dylan McDermott, who, oh my goodness, I sorry, Mr. McDermott, I hated you in American Horror Story, but this is the role you were meant for. Like he played sad dad in American Horror Story. I I just could not stand him. But in this movie, he is uh, iconic. It also stars Charlie Plummer, Samantha Mathis, and Madison Beatty, with cinematography by Luke McCobry and edited by Megan Brooks and Andrew ha- Hasse, Hasse. Music by Matt Villigden. It was released September 22nd, 2018 at the LA Film Festival and November 16th, 2018 in the US with a runtime of 110 minutes. So I love the world building that this movie does immediately. So we have 16-year-old Tyler Burnside who lives 
with a very devout Christian family in a small Kentucky town. And um, no offense to religious people, I feel like it's a blessing. I did not grow up in a religious home. (laughs) And this movie just enforces that even further. And though I cannot speak from real lived experience growing up in a religious home, growing up in a religious area with friends who did grow up in religious homes, this seems really accurate, this movie. Like it doesn't portray Christianity in a negative light in any way, but it portrays like the small town thinking and like status quo stuff. Like that's the bad side. Um, And I think community is great, but this is like the dark side of communities. That to me is like one of the scariest parts of this movie is this town. Like it freaks me out. (laughs) I feel bad for this kid. Its town, The town and its residents are haunted by the memory of the Clove Hitch Killer, an infamous serial killer who bound and strangled 10 known female victims before apparently disappearing 10 years earlier. Like every year they have like a memorial kind of thing. And I, um, the banner kind of stood out to me. It says alive in our hearts. And it's this sort of like stylized... I don't know how to describe it. Just like the the printing on this banner just looks kind of like. Kind of like the home sweet home font. Yeah. The home sweet home font. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And everyone is just, you know, you know, there's the candles and, you know, it's like a little um, tribute to these victims, but alive in our hearts. I don't know for some reason that bothered me. Like, I don't maybe it's just my weird relationship with death but I'm just like that's cute but it's like not yeah that's not how you move on from something either yeah well I but I don't know I think alive I've never lost a human person you know super duper close to me but I just thinking about Branwyn like I do I think my brain has put her in a folder now of like Yes, she's gone, but like, I think alive in my heart would maybe be like I'm a real thing, I would too, say. Yeah, <laughs> I think maybe, maybe it's a you thing. <laughs> it might be a me thing. Okay, we can move on. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think I read this book. Oh, gosh. Chasing the Boogeyman, I believe it was called. Um, hold on, I'm just going to look up the author real quick. But it really reminded me of this movie. Chasing the Boogeyman by Richard Chismar, I highly recommend. Um, And the town in that book is very similar of just like this serial killer, the memory of him haunts this town. Like it's built into the makeup of this town that this has happened. And it's something everyone knows. I feel like that's very important to the decisions that the character makes. So Tyler takes his father's truck one night to see a girl who, while... Um, she just kind of is digging around in the car, finds a bondage photograph between the seats and like, they're, they're about to like make out. But when she sees this, she's like, is this what you're into? And he's like, no, like, I don't even know what this is. Like, and she just asked to be taken home. Like the mood is ruined. She's not going to be with this, this guy now. Um, and this poor kid, cause if you see the guy, I don't know how old this, this actor was, but he looks like a young, like he looks 16 and he looks like the sweetest boy. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so word of the photo spreads among the other teenagers in Tyler's church and scout troop, and they ostracize him, believing him to be a BDSM fetishist. And it sounds funny, but it's not in the movie. It's like so sad because, again, this boy would never do this. He's getting texts from people on his flip phone that say perv. His friend is like, I don't want to be seen with you. And I think this is it's so important that this happens in the beginning of the movie because it just sets the tone of like, This is what happens if somebody finds a photo in your car of this. Now, imagine what would happen if they knew your dad was the Clove Hitch killer. Mm -hmm. Like, just seeing this photo is enough to turn you into pariah. So Tyler, meanwhile, begins to wonder if his father, who is a family man and community leader, it could have something to do with the Clove Hitch killer because it was in his car. Um, And he doesn't want to just tell people, oh, this is my dad's either. So... Tyler investigate Don's, his father's, private shed, and he finds a hidden compartment containing bondage magazines, along with a Polaroid photograph of a beaten and bound woman. And on the Polaroid, it's written, Nora, Lucky's favorite. And this is disturbing. Like, I mean, this would be 
disturbing even without the Clofitch killer connotations. Like if you found, I mean, obviously parents, they're going to have sex too. That is valid. But like to find your parents like stash of porn, I feel like would not, <laughs> it would be very, you know, and especially he's him being like, he's teaching the Boy Scouts and he's like, yeah, the, the very, image, the dissonance like, would be dissonance, hard to deal yeah. with. Yeah. It's yeah. tough. I mean, I think it's, I think it's probably hard. Like, it, you know, if, if, even if your parents are like into like the most vanilla stuff, but this is not just like the magazines, which some, some of them look pretty hardcore, but a Polaroid, what the heck, where did this come from? And, um, it's just all real creepy and, and strange and, and it doesn't make any sense. And yeah, this poor kid is just trying to like reconcile all this together. Yeah. And, um, I wrote down, I forgot to mention earlier, there is a great scene in the very beginning too, where Tyler saves a turtle, um, that's about to be run over in the street. Like we just get that added emphasis of like, <laughs> this is a sweet boy. I don't think he's got a harmful bone in his body. And I feel like that's also such a great contrast between when we get to the innocence. Um, uh, also the, there's a scene in the very beginning where his dad kind of like starts wrestling with him a little bit and he makes him say uncle mm -hmm. like, and and, you know, I mean, Tyler's like 16 and he's just like, okay, dad, like, like, you know, stop, stop doing this. But his dad's like, say it. And that, that scene is just so like unsettling to me. So Tyler fears that maybe his father is the killer. So there's also this girl who I think maybe the existence of those girls, I like her, but I do think it's the weirdest part of this movie <laughs> is this manic pixie dream girl who's for some reason, well, we find out why, but she's. She's known as like the town freak. Um, she's really into the Clove Hitch killer. And um, there's rumors that, you know, she fucked five guys on the basketball team or something. Um, the worst crime a girl could commit. And, um, but he befriends her and her name's Cassie and he asks her for help. She's skeptical in the beginning, but they link the photo to a known Clove Hitch victim Nora and they find blueprints to a BDSM dungeon in the shed. I, this the the blueprints of this are like insane. If you actually like pause and look at them, yeah. There's like I don't know, it's like a merry-go-round looking thing where all these women would be tied to it. It just is like very bizarre. And just they're straight up blueprints. Like it's not like fantasy drawings. They look like you could give this to a builder. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um when Tyler explores his house, his house's crawl space, he finds a box containing the driver's licenses of the 10 Clovich victims and three others, as well as more Polaroid photographs of beaten and bound women. So Don, I guess he, cause we, we see, we see one scene where he's looking at the lock on the shed and he, I guess, always has it turned to zero so that he can know if somebody else has been in it. So he knows that, Tyler's been in the shed so and also there's a great scene where Tyler is watching the dad go in the shed while he's clipping coupons with the mom and his little sister and he goes why does dad never have to clip coupons and the mom's like well your dad has his own hobbies yeah well one thing I noticed like watching it the second time is a lot of shots from Tyler's point of view of his dad are hit, are in the distance like his dad is up at the front teaching the Boy Scouts or like he's looking at him across the yard going into the shed. So there's this distance, right, between the son and the father that I thought was kind of interesting. But it's also that kind of thing that some people have with their parents where, you know, you're starting to see them, I guess, in a different light. Like in, as a teenager, they're not like, the god or the goddess that you thought they were when when you were little now they're like oh dad's like his own person but then of course with this wrinkle like there's that like who is my dad you know element so i think it's all really great me too because i i think that is such a i think both of these movies do such a great job of showing how being how scary it is to be young um i mean I, I know childhood is framed as like, a, and I know we'll talk about this more with the innocence because this is what the, is it, how do you say his name? V vote? Mm -hmm. Vought? I think Vought, um, I think. 
vote. I know this is how he felt reading the interviews he did, but he's like, you know, childhood is framed often as this beautiful like thing that all adults want to get back to. But he's like, I have no nostalgic memories of that. To me, it's scary. And that is honestly how I view childhood a little bit too, is I, the moments, of course, there's a lot of great things, obviously, but the moments that stick out to me are a lot of the moments of like, just confusion and grief of not of realizing that the world that everyone told you is the way things are is not the way things are. Like, mm-hmm. and I don't know what the best answer to that is with regards to telling a kid how life is, but like for, and I, maybe the neurodivergence also has something to do with this, but I just, even like young adulthood have felt like have grappled with this of like building your life and trying to do your best based off of people telling you that's what you do to like succeed in life. And then when you learn that that's just like not true, it's just like, well, why am I doing this then? Like, and yeah, I just feel like there's a lot of weirdness. This movie does a great job of showing the weirdness of like, especially this uh, setting of like, there's a specific way we do things in this Christian community. Mm-hmm. Um, and here's your dad who's like, you know, seen as a great leader. And now you know this about him. Like, how do you even talk to your friends or your family now with this like secret knowledge? Um, You just feel so bad for Tyler. I don't know if we've gotten there yet, but I think the dinner um, when Cassie comes over is a really good scene because she's not like the other families. And she's cool with that. And she would kind of like to shake things up. But Tyler is just like, no, 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 no. Like you can come to dinner, but you got to pretend to be my girlfriend. And like, you know, every time she tries to kind of like um, diverge basically from the script, he's like, she's just kidding. Like, you know, and I think that was all done really well. Me too. Cause, and again, I just relate to him because that emotion, I feel like he's feeling, I feel like as an outsider looking in, you know that that's not like the nice and kind thing to do. You should just accept people, but it's bred out of like extreme anxiety of just Mm -hmm. like, why isn't everyone else doing what we have to do to not get in trouble? You know, I feel like that feeling is embedded in me sometimes that even when I'm out with a friend who I might love, if they're really loud in public, I'm like, why are they doing this? (laughs) Like I'm not being loud. So why would they be loud? Um, But you have to realize that's just your anxiety talking. So Don is kind of suspicious of Tyler. So he takes him camping and sits him down and he's, and God, like Mm. this scene freaks me out so much because he reprimands him for going through his things. So now we know that Don knows that Tyler has seen this like damning evidence, but the way that uh, McDermott is conveying these lines, it's as if your kid broke in and drank some of your alcohol or something. It's like, it does, again, there's the dissonance, like it does not match the gravity of the situation. He's just like, you know, I'm just kind of disappointed. You know, you can't really go through my things like that. It's like, what things? You mean the woman <laughs> bound and gagged? <laughs> the Polaroid, the creepy bondage dungeon you have? Um, yeah, it kind and- of puts it on the kid. Like, of course you're curious, you know, but, but this is like not the way to go about it. It's like, it's it's it it will make you insane, you yeah. know, because you like the kid knows. Okay, right. It's wrong to go through people's things. I get that part, but this is this is like a whole other level, dude. Like the, you're fucked up. Yeah. Even just to have, even if you don't have anything to do with the deaths, you're fucked up to have this stuff. Yeah, and it's not shed. just like youthful curiosity or something like that. Yeah. And it's like gaslighting him and making him think that, yeah, that he did something wrong, that all of this is normal. And (laughs) that it's just like, oh, like a sexual proclivities thing. It's like, no, um, (laughs) that's not what we're talking about. And it's like, you hit it. So you know, it's, you don't want people to see it. Like, but he gives him no good answers for it. And So to explain the evidence, Don says that the Clovehitch killer was actually Tyler's vegetative uncle, Rudy, who we've seen a few times. Like we just see the family, you know, pushing around this older man in a wheelchair. And um, Rudy apparently 
so says Don, became paralyzed after the guilt drove him to a suicide attempt involving his car. And Don says he kept the evidence in hopes of one day giving it to the victim's families to give them closure. But it just was never a good time because then, you know, the little sister was born and what would it do to the mom? And it's just like such bullshit. Like, it's never a good time because these parents, I mean, these family members of the people who were killed are mourning still and forever. You know, it's never it was never a good time for them. Like, it's, it, yeah, and it just doesn't match up with how fucked up it is. And Tyler says, like, okay, well, you either need to turn it over or or burn it. And I just feel like you could hear the, like, ding, ding in Don's head of like, oh, yeah, burning it. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> so Tyler ends the investigation, um, although Cassie remains unsatisfied with Don's story. And I need to point out Tyler's behavior because I've seen some people in reviews – Especially like I read the Roger Ebert review of this movie and it said that it did not, the guy who reviewed it was unhappy with Tyler's behavior. But I'm like, this behavior makes so much sense. Totally. This kid, like your dad's giving you an out and it's like, who would want to accept that their dad is this killer known throughout the town and that if everyone knows this, your family is forever fucked. You know, it's like yeah. you will be paying for the sins of your father forever. Um, and you don't want him to be the killer. Then you have to accept that this man that you love is a murderer. Like it would just be so much easier to accept this. And you're 16. I just, I think that's a stupid criticism of the movie. So there was like this kind of thing with the leadership camp that Tyler was going to go on. And in the beginning of the film, Don had said, we don't really have the money for it, but now suddenly he does. And so he tells Tyler to attend a scout leadership camp um, and then sends his wife, Cindy, and daughter, Susie, to visit Cindy's mother for two weeks. And so when he's home alone, we get this whole sequence where Don photographs himself cross-dressing in bondage positions. And I don't super love the way that this scene happens because there's this like kind of crazy music playing. And it almost seems to be the tone is now like, I mean, this is kind of weird, right? Like, that is just the vibe. It doesn't seem as serious as the rest of the movie. It's mm. like, I don't know what song is playing, but it just kind of feels like we're supposed to laugh at this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's pretty offensive. Um, and it's like, I understand what he's doing, though. It's like, he's trying to, in his own, I mean, I'm not giving any credit to Don, you know, but he's trying to fulfill this fantasy without having to do it in reality. And so he's wearing like a mask and, you know, taking all these photos. And I, I'm not even upset with the idea that he would do that. I just wish the movie hadn't been like, and look at Dylan, Dylan McDermott in a dress now, you know, it just yeah. is like, because that's a pretty, I think that's such an interesting thing to convey uh, the idea of a killer. Like, because then when he looks at the photos, he gets so angry because it's just right. not it. Not it. Yeah. Yeah. I think it could have been directed. I think this is just like a, a, a missed, you know, opportunity for the director. I just, yeah, I, the tone is all weird. And um, yeah, I, I really feel like there should have been like, like McDermott does great when he has his breakdown, you mm -hmm. know, he almost like throws a tantrum because it's just like, just not, you know, he, he, I guess he thought it would be a substitute and it's just not cutting it. And we get mm -hmm. that from the performance, but we don't really get that up to that point. So, yeah, agree. Because I think Dylan does a great job the whole scene. Oh, yeah. Um, and as he's doing it, actually, um, then he gets a knock on the door and it's Cassie. So he quickly changes out of his garb and goes to talk to her in the like foyer area. And she kind of mentions like, oh, nice, like Polaroid you have there because he was using a Polaroid camera. And he says like, oh, you know, Tyler's not here. He's at this camp. Well, I could take a photo of you. And then he asks her to blow on it um, while the photo's developing. But then she gets a call and is like, well, that's my dad. I have to go now. Um, and yeah, then we see him like l while he's lying on the bed looking at these photos. He just like 
shakes his legs and arms like yeah but it's scary it's like a tantrum but it's like a grown man doing it and it's not no, funny it's, it's super like, scary yeah like it's like there's, there's this um, rage this man has there's a movie that really like divides people i like it a lot it's called the stepfather and in that mm. terry have you seen it i think i have yeah terry quinn throws a tantrum in in that film too and it's fucking scary and these are both like i don't know how tall dylan mcdermott is but uh, probably six feet tall but i mean grown-ass men throwing tantrums is fucking scary (laughs) so i think you know um yeah it's kind of reminded me of that just like yeah i don't know what it is it's so uncanny it's just weird and yeah it's not right and (laughs) it's like these are kind of played as a joke but there's the, this kind of trend of like videos of women confronting their boyfriends who have cheated. And th- you actually see that a lot of like some of these guys act like they're children, like yeah. throwing a tantrum because they got caught. Right. And it's so embarrassing. It's like, how could you act like this? Like they're only upset that now they're having to face the consequences of their actions. And it's like they regress like 30 years. It's insane. Yeah. Just sort of weird um, because I just watched this like in Fargo, um, William H. Macy's performance of Jerry Lundegaard. I think he must have designed it, you know, after like a seven year old, because I mean, just like his physicality, you know, and and there's there's a scene where he's trying to like chip this ice off a frozen windshield and he just like has this kind of like meltdown. (laughs) So it just kind of reminded me of that, too. I love so scenes I guess like that. Actors take note if you <laughs> <laughs> if you want to be really disturbing. Um, that's an option. <laughs> yeah, just throw a tantrum. Um, so while Don is out and about, he spots this woman um, in the store, and like they have a little scene where he grabs something for her from this fridge in the grocery store, and. Um, And then I just love this. There's a scene of when she checks out, he's behind, like, he's not behind her, but the shot is kind of like in the grocery store, just looking down at all of the rows of like registers. And so he's like parallel to her at another register buying flowers. And he says to the cashier, these are for my wife. Um, And, but it's like, he's, she's in the foreground. And so we know he's stalking her. I just think the movie has all these great moments of like, this is not it. You know, this is, this man is scary. And so he cases her house and breaks in through the, like kind of the basement. There's like a basement window. And um, also I do love throughout this movie. It's like, I guess he's older now, so it's harder for him to do these murders. <laughs> his back keeps acting up on him. <laughs> and um, this scene is so scary. She's sleeping, watching TV on her couch, and he's standing in like a ski mask just watching her. And then she wakes up and just the, this actress is great. Just the moment when she sees him, she like freaks out. And then he like, you know, covers her mouth and he's like, I listen, I'm not going to hurt you. I'm, I just robbed a bank and I just need somewhere to hide out. So I'm going to take your car. Like, where's your keys? Show me the purse where your keys are. And this woman is of course like freaking the fuck out. And he then gets her to pick up his bag. And he's like, cause my back hurts <laughs> and yes. leads her to the bedroom. And there's just all these moments where he has to like kind of pause. And he's like, oh. <laughs> this is... and, but it's so scary. Cause like for him, he's acting like this is just a, He's not scared, you know, but the no. the difference between their acting of the women, the woman is like out of her mind, afraid of this man, of course. Um, and so then he goes up to her room and ties her up. First, he tells her to tie tie herself up, but of course she doesn't know how. And he's like, well, I guess if you want something done, you got to do it yourself, right? And he starts tying her up and then he kind of has her in that like hog tied position. Um And then begins to strangle her by putting a bag over her head. Well, first he takes photos of her and then he begins to strangle her. But then Tyler appears in the doorway with a rifle and he just says, dad. And so even there we have him not just shooting. He's letting his dad know that he's there. Um, And it's revealed via flashback that Tyler never left for camp 
and he's been secretly watching Don with Cassie. And we also learn that Cassie's mom, who we thought had just ran away, she was one of the three unknown Clove Hitch victims. Um, and this is confirmed by Tyler because she says, Cassie says her mom's name was Crystal and he saw a driver's license with Crystal. So she's, she kind of now has a personal element of like, come on, like we have, we like, if, if this is your dad, we need to stop him. But the part, can we back up to the part yeah, where yeah. he says dad? And then um, McDermott goes, Tyler, you're not supposed to be here. Yeah. And it's just like so <laughs> conversational and like, like, it, I, I, <laughs> this guy is like so. I guess it's so disturbing because I guess he's always himself. Mm. Like, even though he's doing these incredibly heinous things, like, even, you know, like he's hiding the evidence of all that. When we see him interact with a potential victim, he's just himself. Yeah. You know, his, you know, he's, he's, he's using his own voice and he's, I don't know. It's, I think that's, what's really scary. I think that's a good point. Cause it would lose everything if he, if it was like, this man has two sides to him and now mm -hmm. he's in his bad serial killer side. Like that would just kind of be hokey, but it's like to see this like guy be like, but you're not supposed to be here is, you know, it's not like he's like, you fucker, you know, he never curses really. And no. I think that is, that should be the point. And like, I think it is a disservice whenever we try to paint. I mean, obviously movies and whatnot, fiction villains are different, but I, f I feel like people in real life get this wrong idea that people who commit crimes are like bad guys, you know, like, there will be a guy in a bushes who jumps out and he's like, rah, I'm evil, you know, and we don't accept that these are people. And like, I don't know, they're not mustache twiddling villains and they right. can still do horrendous things. Um, it kind of reminds me of that scene in um, The Den where at the end, mm. spoilers for The Den, um, mm. It's, you know, revealed that this is like a show people can watch. And the last guy watching is like a dad who's like kids yeah. come home. Yeah, I love that. I feel like that's Ugh. it's poignant because it's a huge. Yeah, that's a whammy of an ending. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, it's like it's not just basement dwelling creeps who do this shit. It's like no. leaders of a community and stuff. And I think that's kind of like true for both of these movies. And we'll get to it. But I mean, I, I think that's great. And I think, of, yeah, I just think it's brilliant. I mean, that, that the director, you know, had some maybe, you know, a misstep with that one scene. But I think in general, he, he's done a really good job here. I agree. So still in the flashback, Tyler and Cassie go to speak to Don, but he's not home. But they do find rope fibers on the bed. And so they go to the house where they had previously seen him with the stalked woman and now we're back to the present where Tyler confronts his dad as he's taking photos of the woman tied up. His dad is very calm and, you know, tells him, you know, I'm not, <laughs> he gives him the, oh, I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. Yeah. And just kind of tries to talk. First, he tries to come up with this lie that he's having an affair with this woman. And that actually the mom knows and she's cool with it. Um but of course, Tyler's like, no, I know that's not true. Then Cassie comes in and to help the bound woman, Tyler tries to talk him into giving himself up. But then Don grabs Cassie and knocks her out. So Tyler then kind of lowers the rifle. He doesn't really know what to do. I mean, again, he's a 16 year old and this is like total shock for him. Yeah. And um. So then the, the father takes the gun away from him. Oh, this scene is so great because he's like, remember, give it to me, but first. Remember when you were a kid, you used to love it when I said that, but first, but first. Even now, he's just trying to appeal to Tyler's like, to, to his role as a father in Tyler's life. It's so demented. And then when he grabs the gun, he immediately turns it around to try to shoot Tyler, but it clicks because there's no bullets in it. Tyler was never going to shoot his dad. And right. the the face that Tyler has is so tragic. Just knowing like, you can't come back from that. 
like your dad could, would have gladly just killed you in this moment. So then they begin to fight and scuffle and Don tries to strangle Tyler, but then Cassie wakes up and knocks Don unconscious with a lamp. Also, I do find like the whole knocking unconscious thing. It's like, that's just not how like no. life works, but yeah. I'll, 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 you know, that's, that's okay. <laughs> well, I'll accept it. So now that everything's kind of like a lull, Cassie begins to dial 911, but Tyler grabs her hand and he's also like breathing so heavy because he's just been strangled and stops her. And so then we cut next to, and I think they're, they, they have their discussion later, but a- after this, where he grabs her hand with the phone and then just cuts to now we see like a missing poster with Don's face on it. And now there's a huge, it's really sad. It's like, there's a comparison between this scene in the beginning, in the beginning of the movie, Don is making pancakes for the family. And now in this one, it's just Tyler, his mom and his little sister, his mom's got like a Walmart jacket on and she's making oatmeal. And the, the little sister is like, well, I want pancakes. And the mom's like, well, you know, oatmeal is just pancake ingredients. And kind of has a moment where she's like, just, you know, let just calm down right now. Like the mom's obviously tired from having to work now where I guess she didn't have to work before. So, and the, the, the vibe is just darker. Like the lights are darker and it's really sad because Tyler did do the right thing in stopping his dad. But this was always the outcome is that, I mean, they were living a lie, but the mom and the sister are never going to know. Like it's right. so yeah. sad. Um, and so then they're informed, like the mom gets a call, the police have discovered Don's body and his death is considered a suicide. And later the mom talks to Tyler because they, we learn that Cassie and Tyler staged it as like a hunting accident, but there's a really sweet scene with the mom where she's sitting down with Tyler and she's like, well, the police would like to talk to you because the way it looks, it doesn't look like what happened to your dad was an accident. And Tyler's face just like falls and he's like, they think somebody else got him. And she's like, oh, honey, no, they think it's a suicide. <laughs> and the mom breaks down and cries and he holds her. It's just really sad. Um, so yeah, Cassie and Tyler discuss the fact that the woman apparently never saw Don's face. So she can never connect him to the attack. So they're just going to let it be that nobody knows that he was the killer. I do have a little bit of problem with this. It's like he left, yeah. they left no DNA at this woman's house. Like when they knocked well, him out, there was no blood on the wall. Like you guys are right. that good at cleaning. That makes no sense. And this woman would call the police. Sure. Um, but anyways. I, I also don't like it that we see, well, you're just about to say it, but I mean, I, I just don't like this whole, I don't like this, this ending, the ending where sequence. they show, like what happened at the campsite and everything like that. Like, I, I don't think we really needed it. Yeah, I agree. Cause we get the next scene of at their church. They're now having a funeral for Don. Tyler delivers a eulogy and intercut is scenes of him and Cass. Just basically what happened was they took Don to the forest and framed his death as a hunting accident. And there's a scene with like Tyler, you know, about to shoot him. And like Dawn kind of wakes up and kind of looks at him like, okay, this is fine. Yeah. But I, I don't think it's super neat. I think seeing the aftermath is powerful enough. Yeah, I do too. I think it would have been a better movie if they had just done like the missing and then the bodies discovered and then the eulogy. I think that would have been stronger. Yeah. And um, Tyler delivers a very, you know, even the eulogy though, it's very like just a script kind of which yeah. is really sad is like, he probably knew his dad better than everyone else here, but he can't say anything. And he just says like, kind of like tongue in cheek references, but he's like, you know, there were several different sides to my dad and to the community. He was a leader to my family. He was a father to me. He was my dad, you know? And, and I guess that's certainly true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's not wrong. Um, and he ends the eulogy with, Dad, if you can hear me, I love you. Um, and again, I don't, 
it makes total sense that he wouldn't reveal that that's his dad is the clove hitch killer. Like he's trying to save his family, the heartbreak, even though that's a very selfish decision. Cause now Cassie might have some closure, but none of the other families are ever going to have closure. They might think for the rest of their lives that this guy is still out there. Um, And I think that's objectively horrible, but I think the movie does a good job of explaining why a child would make this choice right now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he loves his mom. He loves his sister, you know, and, and we already saw, like you said, at the beginning, the consequences for a photo getting ideas. Um, so I, I, that's a tough one. I mean, yeah, I think it would have been a nobler choice to tell the truth, but if you're 16, it makes total sense to me that this is a choice you would make. Yeah. And he's already thrust into this position now. Like, you know, we see him comforting his mom. It's like, while she's crying, like now he's, he's assigned himself this position of like, I need to take care of my family. And that's what he's been raised to do. So um, I think it's sad, but I I like it when characters make decisions that I don't know, have like, that aren't just like, you know, what a perfect hero would do, because that's more in line with reality. And it's more interesting, I think. So some trivia, Dylan McDermott wore a prosthetic belly to add weight and help transform his appearance. He does kind of have like a dad look. He looks like a dad. Like for how in, handsome in a, he is, he they did a good job dadding him up. Yeah, I think yeah, the the facial hair, you know, mm-hmm. and the little pooch and everything. Yeah, and his and his uh, wardrobe. Yes, like, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you have seen this man at Home Depot before. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the scene where Don Burnside and his group of scouts is seen in a classroom, there is a number of knots drawn on the blackboard with the clove hitch knot prominently in the middle. Spooky. I never took a knots lesson, so I did not notice that. Well, what does Letterboxd have to say about it? Peyton 20 gave it a half star and said, This is, quite possibly, the worst movie I've ever seen in my life. The acting is putrid, and it looks like it was filmed on a smart fridge. (laughs) (laughs) Didn't know they had cameras. (laughs) Ingrid gave it a half star and just said, Pessimo. Great pronunciation. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Puke on bed gave us our ass review by giving it a half star and saying, shit was ass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, puke on bed. <laughs> Ella Alfin gave it five stars and said, Dylan McDermott is such fun casting for a dumb little killer man. I yes, agree. I agree. I think this movie would not be the same without him. No, he's he makes the movie. I mean, really, that's why you watch this film is for yeah, is for Dylan McDermott's performance. Anakin said, "I Anakin gave it five stars and said, I know that wasn't the point of the scene, but when Cassie immediately got worried when she saw Tyler's dad looking too much at another woman and walking behind her, like following her, but Tyler didn't see it that way. I totally felt that because only women can understand this irrational fear." I think that's a good point. Like, and obviously we have Cassie's like background to why she so wants to find this. But I do think that is a thing that the majority of women think about. Like, um, I mean, I, I think, I feel like that is kind of ingrained in my bones. Like if I feel that there's somebody walking close behind me, I'm like, let me figure this situation out. You know, it's scary. And I won't go for walks at night still. Like, no thanks. <laughs> Kiara gave it five stars and says, bitch, why ain't nobody talking about this movie? It's good as fuck. I agree, Kiara. Well, we're talking about it, Kiara. Yeah, so listen to the world of horror. <laughs> well, what phobia is that? Marinthophobia is an extreme fear of being tied up or bound. It's New phobia scary. for the pod. What? New phobia for the pod. (laughs) New phobia acquired. (laughs) Let's rate it in terms of knots. Sure, why not? (laughs) I would give it four knots. I'll give it three and a half knots. Wow. Three and a half. Why the one and a half taken off? For the ending, I think, Mm. mostly. Like, I was kind of in. 
I was kind of all in, you know, and then it was like, oh, okay, like it's all kind of like wrapped up and I, I don't, so to speak. <laughs> and I don't feel like it needed that. I think it would have been better with, mm. with some of that left on, on specified or something. So yeah. Yeah. But it's good. I mean, I've seen it twice now and I'll spoiler. I would watch it again. I think I would watch it again too. <laughs> what have we learned? Well, don't judge I a mean, book when it's cover. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, yeah, it's just hard when you, it's hard to face the truth. I think it's really hard yeah. to face the truth. Yeah. So I, I don't know what, I don't know what else to say about that, but I think this movie does a great job of talking about that. Like, and I, I, I don't know if you had a chance, but I sent you that little interview with the, with the woman BTK's yeah, I watched daughter. That. Yeah. Yeah. And how, I mean, oh my gosh, it's just like tragic. It's yeah. like your whole world is just destroyed. Like everything you thought was true about this person isn't. And I, I feel like on a much, obviously that's like the next degree, like only a few people will ever have that experience ever, like that specific experience. But like, I feel like everyone has felt that on a much smaller scale yeah. in there. Like it's something we can relate to, which is why it seems so horrifying is like the moments I have had rocked my world. So now imagining that it's this thing you feared is your family would be horrible. Yeah. Favorite scene and or kill. Well, there's not really any kills. Um, favorite scene. I guess it would be that tantrum. I thought that was pretty good. Yeah, that's really good. Um, I do like the scene where Tyler confronts Don, mm -hmm. you know, and Don's like, you're not supposed to be here. Yeah. And he says something like, are you going to shoot me, bud? Yeah. You know, and it's uh, just like. <laughs> so like. He's just always in this dad role, you know. Yeah. It's like, Ugh, so creepy. Very creepy. Who wins the You Fool Award? I guess Dawn. Oh, well, sure. <laughs> I mean, like, it feels wrong to call Tyler a fool. One thing is, I mean, I and I'm glad they didn't do this, is like, I mean, I think we're supposed to assume that Dawn's responsible for Rudy's situation, right? Oh. But I don't yeah. think they, they ever spelled that out. So I think I thought that was pretty good. Um Ugh. Like he always had that as a plan to blame it on yeah. Rudy. Yeah. Mm. But he still wanted oh. to have the things to look at because it gave him gratification. No, I meant that he caused the accident. No, but I mean like, could he have caused that thinking? Oh, maybe. Oh, that's Cause, really diabolical. Yeah, because that would be... Because that was Tyler's whole thing was like, well, when Rudy got injured, that's when the killing stopped. So right. maybe he wanted it to be. And then he didn't want to throw. He would have burned the pictures, but he obviously kept them for some sort of, you know, because that's why he's trying to recreate them after after he loses them. So those were it's, his like prizes. It's kind of like um, pure evil. Like if that's if that's yeah. what he did. Right. Like he wanted to stop, but he couldn't stop on his own. Mm -hmm. So he had to like, you know, maim his brother. I mean, I guess he wanted the, the brother ideally to die. So mm -hmm. he wanted to murder his brother so he could be revealed what as if, the real killer. What if the brother knew, but then yeah. tried to kill himself? Like maybe he did oh. feel guilty, but then, I don't know, it's things that, that we don't know, but. That's great. I love that though, because it's just all... You know, we only know as much as Tyler knows. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I liked it that, like, there wasn't any implied abuse. You yeah. Know, like sometimes in like the, these depictions of these kind of like uptight Christian families, there's this sort of suggestion or literal, you know, depiction of abuse. And I'm glad there wasn't any of that. Yeah, I guess um, it did seem that scene in the beginning where he's kind of like wrestling with him, like there was definite like 
Tyler doesn't seem like he ever truly was like, I love my dad. You know, like he loved his dad in like a, of course I do. That's my dad kind of way. But I feel like right. even in the beginning, there is still a distance between them. Like, yeah, and maybe it would always have to be that way if you're such a, you know, depraved killer dude. Well, right. And I do think there is a distance just in terms of like the, the dad, like, you know, the round of applause and just all this kind of like fakey, fakey, nice, nice, yeah, like attitude. So it does, it's not real. So that's like a distance, like a built in distance. And, um, I think it's good. I think it's underrated. And I think that, um, I'm glad we, I'm glad we chose this one. Me too. Okay, the innocence or dis uskildiga summary from IMDb. During the bright Nordic summer, a group of children reveal their dark and mysterious powers when the adults aren't looking. In this original and gripping supernatural thriller, playtime takes a dangerous turn. All right, I didn't need the last part. <laughs> <laughs> Written and directed by Eskil Vogt. Starring Raquel Lenora Flutem. I don't know that, if that's how you say any of these names, but um, Alva Brinsmo Ramstad, Sam Ashraf, Mina Yasmin Bremseth Ashheim, Ellen Dorit Peterson, Morten Svartveit. Svartveit. <laughs> Come on, Norwegians. <laughs> Kadia Yusuf and Lisa Tuna. You did great. Thank you. Cinematography by Sterla Bramf Grovlen and edited by Jans Christian Fodstad. <laughs> Sorry. Music by Pessy Levanto. Release dates the 11th of July 2021 at Cannes and the 27th of August 2021 in Norway. It has a running time of 118 minutes. How'd you feel about this runtime, Matt? A little long. <laughs> I think a little bit could have been cut out of this. Yeah. But Um, if you look at any reviews by um, any Americans, they all agree. It's a little slow. Our attention spans might be a little bit stunted. Please forgive us Norwegians. (laughs) (laughs) I was fine with it, but um, I'm kind of like I was telling Mac before we started, I'm kind of all in on Eskivil Volkt. Mm-hmm. huge fan and um so i was fine with it all right so we meet ida and her older sister anna and i like the first shot because ida is asleep and she looks like such a sweet innocent little babe and we will learn that she is not oh. also just fun fact the woman who plays her mother is actually her mother oh and um so and is also the mother in Telma. Oh. So we meet the two girls. Um, Ida is younger. Anna has nonverbal autism. And we see that Ida is curious, I guess, curious plus resentful of her sister. And she pinches her leg. Um, and when she gets no reaction. That scene is so upsetting. Like, yeah, it's really upsetting. I, it made me so, it kind of like, I'm I'm not, I, I think it's important to depict things that are uncomfortable. But what made me so sad was that I just, it's just something I had never thought about before. And I was just like, I bet that happens all the time. Like, I yeah. bet people just do do that to people who can't fight back, like, all the time. And because they think they feel no pain. Like, that idea that somebody can't feel pain is like so harmful to anyone you think that about, you know, and that just, I don't know, it just, it made me really sad. I kind of, I even had to pause and take a break just from that one part, just cause I was like, okay, that this whole movie is going to be like this. And, yeah. I, I and this is already a lot. <laughs> no, that's where we're starting. Okay. Yeah. So I guess, I guess like everybody else on the planet who's reviewed this film, I guess before we go any further, Content warning. 
for harm and death to a cat. Yes. Uh, which is, I mean, people in the letterbox were like, I shut it off after the cat. Okay. I have one thing to say about the cat scene. Now I did listen to it on mute. I did not have the sound on and I kind of skipped through the end half. But I will say, first, my mom was very nice to warn me because if you do not know Wohos, uh, seeing cats in duress, like, I, I I admit that it's I'm not my brain is not fair to all creatures. If the scene had been in, about a puppy, I don't think I would have felt the same way. And I know that's just a me thing. Uh, it's that's just how my brain works. I can't. I have two cats. Is all I can think about. Um, but I looked up the does the dog die site, and people were like, "I'm not even going to describe what happens in it. It was just the worst thing I've ever seen." And so I got so curious that I was like, oh, people said." Don't listen to the noise. There's a there's a crunch you don't want to hear. I was like, I'll mute it. But then when I watched it, I was like, you know what? This really isn't that bad. People were like, this is the worst depiction of an animal. To-. I'm like, dog, I have seen one million times worse than this. Like, and I when I looked up like how the director responded, he was just like, it's not real. And I yeah. feel like that's it's it's really not like it's a little bit realistic, but like. I don't know. I think some people are being a little bit over dramatic, and I say this I as someone who, again, I did listen to it on mute. And if I had been in the theater, I probably would have been really upset. But mm-hmm. if you're at home and you're able to, it's just it's really not that bad. I think people are being dramatic. I think people are being dramatic too, and it's kind of funny because I I watched a number of interviews with him, and you know he was asked like every single time about it, and he's like, look. The cat's okay. I'm a cat owner. I have two cats. And then I, I saw an interview where the guy's like, did the kid who played Benjamin, is he okay? And he's like, everyone's okay. Like, everyone's fine. Like, Because they know like it's not everyone- real. <laughs> yeah, it's a fucking movie. But I mean, but, but I, I'm actually okay. I mean, I don't love it. I mean, I don't love it that these kids like harmed and killed a cat. But Guess what? People, kids, harm and kill animals, like, all the fucking time. Yeah. And and I do find it so... What, what does it say about us as a people that, like, <laughs> like, that's the biggest thing. But there's, like, children who get harmed in this movie. But, like, that's... You can accept, you can accept yeah. that that's not real. But, like... But that's what he said, too. He's like, um, you get a bigger reaction if you kill a cat than if you harm a child. That's weird. That is that weird. That is weird. It is weird. It's weird. Um, <laughs> so, it's yeah, weird. I I feel like I have a little bit of like, I say this, I'm getting on a soapbox. I'm just saying this to animal lovers. I get you. I, I have to look things up. It really affects me. But you're doing a little sure. bit too much. Like, I think you're doing a little bit too much and you're being a little bit dramatic. And just don't watch it or just skip it. That's why Doug's the dog. That's why Does the Dog Die exists is for people like you. Go on that site, look at the time and just move on with your life. I don't know. I I just was, I was expecting the worst thing. And that, and that's what made me watch it was I was like, I got to see what this is now. Everybody's saying it's the worst thing humanity's ever done. And it really wasn't that bad. And also, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't real. The cat wasn't really harmed. You know, if if you want to get upset and people do get upset, you know, go ahead, go and watch a Jallo from the 1970s. <laughs> any Jallo. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> but also reflect for just one second. Did you ever cut an earthworm in two? Did you ever like pour water on an anthill? Did you I mean, come on, let's be real. This is the way kids are. And I actually did want to ask you, because he said that everyone he talked to had memories of doing something cruel to, you know, things that were like animals, other kids or younger siblings, just basically someone weaker than you. Would you say that is true? Like, I was trying to reflect on my own childhood. I was like, did I ever do it? And I definitely did bully some kids. Like, but I don't think, and I know it's saying this as like, a, I never did it, but like, I think any harm I ever did to an animal was like unintentional as a kid. Like, I won't go into specifics, but yes, I did. 
I mean, I, I it seems like that, it's a normal thing. I think it's a very normal thing and I don't feel great about it. I don't, you know, wear it as a badge of pride or something like that. And I've heard stories, I would say, that are worse than what I did. But yes, I did. And I feel like some of it has to do with, you know, having very little power as a Mm -hmm. child. And I think some of it has to do with not having a lot of supervision. Um, I'm a product of the 70s. And so, you know, we were left for hours and hours and hours on our own um, in a way that I don't think you were. Yeah. I don't know. So, but I saw people in like the does the dog die being like, you know, then this made me hate the character that did it. But what you just said of like, you were a young kid with no power and all these examples he listed animals, other kids or younger siblings are all things are all beings that have less power than the kid doing the harm. And it's like, should we not just look at why, what would make a kid do that? Like that's, yeah. If it's such a normal thing, like, and, and it makes sense for the kid in this movie, why he did it. Like, I don't know. I just feel like there were some people are like, what's the point? That's the fucking point. Like, how is that? I I don't know. I felt like I was kind of, I I felt like I was crazy a little bit because there's, seems like people care more about that than the entire message of the movie. And I do feel like it's a good movie. And that's not even the part of the movie I have an issue with is the cat death. I mean, I I do want to talk about Ben's character because I I feel like I, I, I heard a review that said that he was just sort of depicted as a villain and it was like the villain's origin story or something like that. I, I had a lot of sympathy for Ben. Um, I think we are supposed to take that he's abused. Um, he has a, he has a huge bruise when he takes off his shirt. Um, and that doesn't, that's not just living your life, you know, it, you, no. and you bumped into something and you have a bruise that big. So that was an intentionally caused injury to this child. And uh, yeah. Anyway, I, I don't, and these kids are young. Like we're talking like seven to 12, maybe these are really little kids. Prepubescent. Um, yeah. Anyway, I, and yeah, I, I think a lot of people missed the point of this film. <laughs> which is a shame because I, I mean, I know we'll get into it, but I really liked Ben's character and I felt like from the movie, what the movie put it, what is in the film, mm. he feels like a sympathetic character to me. Like, and the way that they portray his rage, it's like this kid has shame. Like already at this young of an age, this kid is filled with shame and I don't know. I I just I don't see him as being evil and I don't even think that's what the depiction is. Like he clearly feels remorse when he realizes that people see him a certain way. I don't know. We can get into it, but <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what's happening is Ida and Anna and their family are moving to this um this apartment complex for the summer where a lot of people are gone. Um, on summer vacation and Ida is a little upset that she's not going to get a summer vacation and she has to take care of her older sister, Anna. And so she's very resentful of that. One day Ida meets Ben and the two strike up a friendship and Ben, he's like, let me show you something. And they go into the woods and he shows her that he is able to move very light objects with telekinesis and her delight at this is really fun to see. This girl's face is so expressive. Yeah. These kid like, actors are so good. They are really good. Like, it's remarkable. <laughs> um, and I I heard that Vogue took a year to, like, find them and uh, prepare them for this movie and things like that. So they did great. All these actors are great. Ida is asked to bring Anna to the playground and just sort of leaves her there on a swing set and goes off with Ben and they play soccer until a bully comes along and takes the ball. This is of course very upsetting and scary. And then we have already sort of, sort of met Aisha um, who um, is of course 
the sweet angel of a character. She's Aww. really sweet. <laughs> yeah. And she has a cat, Susu, who has gone missing. And uh, Ben finds the cat. And um, with Ida, they take it um, into the stairwell. They take it all the way, you know, as high as they can. And they drop the cat down the stairwell. I think it's a really great scene in that when we see Ida at first, like the anticipation, she's like, are we really doing this? You know, and she's really excited. But then, um, you know, when he drops the cat, she's, you know, the implication hits her in a way that it doesn't really hit Ben. He's like, do you think it's dead? Like he's still kind of like um, into the fascination of it. It's not dead. And I think what is so good too, is like when, when they first see the cat, like, Ben says that he's seen the cat outside, so he named it Jabba. And when Ida is petting it, like there's such a sweetness in her face of like, because Ben is also petting it and they're being really friendly with the cat. And Mm -hmm. like, Ida just seems to enjoy the presence of this cat. And then he like puts his shirt on the cat and she just thinks that's funny. Like, haha, you know. Um, But I, I feel like that was important of like, she saw the like, I I don't know. There was something fun you could have done with this cat that wasn't this. Right. You know, but I mean, I think this kind of goes back to the idea that boat wanted to explore where children around this age, like seven, eight, nine believe in magic and they believe that like, there aren't so many rules that like adults have. And one of the things that you hear is that cats always land on their feet. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, it's, it's an experiment. I mean, obviously it goes horribly wrong, but I think it is, I think the most innocent reading of this is they want to see what's going to happen. Yeah. And so that's why I think they can be forgiven and why people have missed the point of why this scene is in there. Because this is just sort of the way their brains work. Yeah. And he made a good point in the interview I read where he was like, these moments that like you have to go through things as a kid that then help you decide what your morals are. And it's stuff like, like you, you push the boundary of your own morals to see what it feels like. Because I can remember as a kid, like when I bullied or like would say mean things to other kids. It's like, and then you see how upset they are. It's like, I did feel sad after that. Like I was like, oh, like, and then when you, and then like I would have friends who would like look at me differently. And then I'm like, oh, like, and also nobody likes this. Like, why am I doing this? Cause, mm. but I, I couldn't put two and two together all the, cause people would bully me or be say mean things to me. So I was like, well, let me try it out. And it did not feel good. And I would have never known that if I had not done it. And I'm not saying it was right to do it, but also at the same time, I was a kid and I did not know any better. And I don't do it now as an adult who does know better. So I just feel like that is the whole point of this is like, Ida knows now, oh my God, like she feels bad. And this is a difference between her and Ben is like, she, but she also has a completely different life than Ben, as we have seen. Yeah, that's exactly the, I think the point. Yeah. You know? That she's got, I mean, she's jealous of her sister because her sister gets all this attention, yeah, you know, and needs all this care. And that's a very childish way of thinking about it. So, I what, mean, she and she's a young about, child, like she's the younger sister, like younger siblings. <laughs> yeah. I can speak as a younger sibling. It's like you expect to be the baby, you know, you expect yes. she never got that chance because her sister has always been the baby, the baby. of the family. Because she yes. needs more help than she does. So now she's like, mm-hmm. what the fuck? But like Ben, on the other hand, has a horrible life, you know? Yeah. This is like the one time he's made a friend, it seems. And yeah. it's so tragic because she she is really interested in his powers and whatnot. The whole movie is sad. Like it's not there's good people and bad people, in my opinion. No, I mean, everybody's just... A mishmash is a combination like no nobody is you know now i'm sad <laughs> <laughs> i oh one um, more thing i also yeah. feel like when we've seen ida do bad things like when she steps on an earthworm 
It's like an earthworm can't convey to you that it's in pain. And right. her sister does not outwardly show what she right. can tell is a sign of pain. But then when she sees this cat after it's been injured, she knows that this cat is in pain and knows what she did yes. is wrong. I feel like that's, I don't know. I don't, I think this scene is necessary. I get what he's trying too. to say with it. I do too. And then, and then it, it, it continues. The scene continues. They go to investigate the cat and it's limping and obviously not doing very well. And Ben um, crushes the, the cat's skull with his foot and that's the crunch. And Ida, you know, turns away and she's like, I gotta go. Like that's, that's too much for her. When she um, emerges from this basement, she sees that Anna has been playing with Aisha and Aisha demonstrates that she's able to communicate with Anna through telepathy. And it's later revealed that Anna can move objects with telekinesis. But Ida discovers that the powers are the strongest when the three children are together. And that she's the only child of the group without any supernatural powers. But I love her attitude is that she just thinks everyone is so cool. And she even says like with a smile, like, I guess I don't have any. Um, but she, but they're still including her, you know, and like, she still yeah. feels the magic of them together. I thought that was a uh, sweet. I'm glad that she wasn't like, didn't have like a chip on her shoulder about it. Yeah, me too. But I don't know how to describe this girl. Aisha, she just has like such a gentle, like almost like beautific, like angel, like a cherub. I don't know. Yeah, she's so sweet. And she like kind of laughs and she's delighted that like she can have this communication with Anna. And um, I just love this whole part of the movie. It's just really, really nice. Yeah. The children practice their powers and strengthen them. And Anna begins to speak words verbally. While sending mental messages, Ben becomes angry at the message. Ben is a turd and Aisha's subsequent laughter. He knocks Aisha over telekinetically. That's kind of a cool shot. Yeah, she just like gets pushed by nothing. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, and Anna intervenes. Also love that shot. Mm -hmm. Right. So as soon as Aisha gets like pushed over, Anna like runs down the hill to toward her. And then Ben still wants to attack Aisha. And Anna just like stops him like mm -hmm. at every turn. And it's really cool. And one thing I like about the depiction of these characters is Anna is very clear about the love and affection that she has for Aisha and that she's going to protect her. And Ben is not going to mm -hmm. continue to interfere with her. And Ida is sort of hanging back. Like she's sort of like, she doesn't really know what to do. And I, I just love that difference between the two of them oh we missed that one scene that i just have to bring up because it made me so upset too when ida puts glass in anna's shoes oh my god and then like we see this scene and I, I guess i'm saying this to set up the one qualm i have is like so we see because i uh, Anna drops a glass at one point. Ida notices some glass swept in a corner. She sticks it in Anna's shoe. They go for this interview for like a school for Anna, I guess. And she's like tapping her foot. And we know that it's because her foot hurts, but she cannot communicate that verbally. And only when they get home and they see her foot is bloody, do the parents know that there was glass in there. And I feel like it's like that made me so upset because I was like, obviously that she's trying to communicate something, but she couldn't do it in a way that everyone understood. And I guess my issue with the whole like now she can speak thing is like, mm. but that's not reality. And that doesn't like fix this issue, I guess. It's like, right. We need to give not every person can communicate verbally for hearing people to hear, you know, and, but people who cannot communicate verbally still have like intricate minds and thoughts that deserve to be respected and have autonomy that deserves to be respected. And I feel like Ida only respects Anna once she gains powers of speech. Yeah. 
I think you might be onto something. I was kind of upset at the reaction of the parents. Yeah, me too. Because um, it felt like, oh, our problems are solved. Yeah, and like the dad, like the mother. Well, both of them, I don't think they're, they really, well, first of all, they don't believe it, which is fair. But then when she says, uh, mommy and daddy, now they're like, oh, our angel, our child, you know, and they're sort of like giving her all this like love and affection and like, yes, good job. Like you're doing it kind of thing. And I'm just like, you fuckers, like, you know, it's, it seems like Aisha's the only one who has access to Anna, like to, to who the person she is because yes. of her, like the bond that they have. And we should say that like when, when Anna's, you know, foot is all bloody, Aisha's is also all bloody. She doesn't really know like what the connection is. And then she, she figures it out that it's, so she's actually not hurt that it's um, Anna, but but yeah, and I don't know exactly when it is in the movie, but um, but sorry, but um, I, I just got really emotional all of a sudden. <laughs> oh, but I think it's it's in this wood scene, you know, where Ida is saying to Aisha, mm -hmm. Anna doesn't feel any pain, and she says, "Yes, she does," and she says, "But she never cries," and Aisha says, "She cries on the inside." See, and I love that scene. And I feel like Aisha's character is great. It's, I feel like Anna gaining powers of speech is not the right move, but I feel like their, the friendship she has with Aisha is because here's Aisha yeah. saying, well, I can understand her, but just because you can't doesn't mean she isn't, you know, a person with thoughts and feelings and wants and needs and stuff. And I feel like that's completely, because I thought that was very sweet. And you could turn it into like a metaphor of just like, I don't know, people who work to understand others who cannot communicate verbally. Um, and that it's like, I don't know, just speech shouldn't have to be packaged in a way for hearing people to hear for it to be respected, I feel like. And I was trying to think of like, if there's a spectrum of innocence, like, who would be like the most innocent. And mm -hmm. I think it's Aisha. Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe Anna, you know, and then Ida and then Ben, I guess, or, or I don't know, maybe those two, last two are reversed. And so of course Aisha has to die because, you know, innocence must be lost ends. <laughs> innocence must be lost. Right. And so, um, Okay, so we backed up and we talked about the injury and we talked about the the verbal thing. I mean, yeah, I, I it just really it just really did upset me the way the parents are like their demeanor toward Anna completely changes. Yeah, you know, now that she can verbalize her thoughts. Yeah, in the woods, there's sort of this um, there's this um, face off. What do I want to say? There's a yeah, face off between Anna and Ben, and we just sort sort of see this like these these like wood sh wood pieces and things on the ground are kind of like vibrating, and Anna actually gets injured by a piece of wood, um, getting like lodged in her leg, which I don't I want to know what happened. I guess they removed it, and that's like off screen. But I'm just like, how? Yeah. Like that seems like a hospital type. I know, thing, but. Like, did they take this her seems, to the hospital? It didn't seem like it. I mean, she's just, and we never see her with the bandage on her leg. That's true. You know? Because that was like, like the mom. Deep. That was in there. Yeah. yeah. Um, at home, Ben is scolded by his mother and he knocks her out with a pan. And then, interestingly, um, Aisha is sitting across the table from her mother and her mother like appears to have blood dripping down her forehead. And Aisha's like, mom, you're bleeding. Mom, mom, you're bleeding. And the and mom's kind of like wiping her head. And she's like, what are you talking about, Aisha? I'm not, I'm fine. What do you do? You know? And so Aisha knows now that somebody else's mom is like hurt really bad. Now, the only problem I had with Aisha and all this like, tuning into like other people's pain is what about the cat 
Yeah, it's never, we never see her like, because that was what I was scared of was like, that would be so horrible. But yeah, she like never finds it or talks about the cat again. Or has the no has the feeling like the pain of the cat or anything like that. Or so like the fear maybe, from Ida or something like that. So weird. that, that could have been handled a little differently. The mother um is knocked out and then Ben with his powers, he dumps a, a boiling pot of water onto her legs, um, which is pretty horrible. And she's unconscious, but then when she wakes up, she asks him to call for help. And I, I thought he did, but he didn't. Um, so as time goes on in the movie, we just see her body still lying there in the kitchen, um, which is, it, I, I don't know. It's so horrible. It's, I... <sighs> And the actor for Ben, I feel like, again, here, it's like, this is sad because they're before I feel like he doesn't, he doesn't know if she's dead or not. So at one point he is kind of like wiping her with a towel. And, but then it's like when she wakes up, it's like, he doesn't know what to do, you know, like, um, and I mean, yeah, like you said, we've seen her be a very not good mom and be really mean to him and abuse him. But he's he while he's looking at her body, he also looks so sad, and it's just like he doesn't know what to do. He's just a kid, and yeah. um, I just love it when people explore the idea of like using powers without restraint. Because I think Vote also made a good point in his interview. If he was just like, if you were a kid and you had these powers and you could get back at somebody, like again, if we if if most people do something cruel to some to somebody who's weaker than them. Imagine now all of humanity is weaker than you. And you're a kid who's, kids are like built with narcissism. It's like, it's not them being narcissistic. It's just how their brain works. And I don't know, with that unrestrained power, I think this would, this would happen. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a really vivid description of what it looks like, you know, when a child is in pain and like can't, handle it like like they can't handle it so yeah yeah i don't know i think this is a great movie i think it really is like a really creative way to talk about like like the powerlessness the inherent powerlessness of children and then like what if they had power and like what would happen and i think this is all pretty accurate yeah So Ben realizes that he's able to, quote, fetch other people and influence them to do what he wants. While in a trance, he directs a neighbor to kill his bully, the bully from before. After telling Ida of his power while playing in the woods, she encourages him to prove it by controlling her. He does so by making her climb onto a fridge. When the spell is broken, she says that she saw a snake which in reality was a tree branch. And that's kind of interesting because he's like, I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. Like all I wanted was for you to be on the fridge. So what did you think about that part? Um, Part of me thinks it was just to set up the future part where like the snake is the call to her to realize she's, you know, in a dream state. But also I feel like maybe that's just vote saying like, kids' imaginations are really vivid and like your fears jump out at you more maybe when you're a kid. It's like, I mean, in the beginning, we see her looking at a shadow in her, you know, she's in a new bedroom that she's never slept in before. And we see the shadow and the shadow looks like it has fingers that are moving, but that's just her. And that's because she's in an unfamiliar place. So I I liked that scene. I I felt like it was him just saying that when you're young, things are so scary because you don't like now as an adult, we maybe have had a bajillion instances of seeing a shadow and being like, what is that? And being like, it's a shadow, you know, but if that's the first time you see it as a kid, it could be a creature. I don't know. Um, so I like that. Yeah. He shows Ida he can snap the large twig and later snaps the leg of a child on the playground. <laughs> that so the like idea in your head of like 
when you see the branch snap and then it just keeps focusing on the kids' ankles, like while they're playing, yeah. you're just like, oh no, I know it's about to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Aisha is drawn outside by this and tells Ben to stop. He throws a rock at her using his powers and then attacks her by seemingly forcing her throat to close up. Ida physically pushes Ben over and the spell is broken. Anna and Aisha resolve to stop Ben because they know that he will hurt them. But that night, Ben uses his powers to influence Aisha's mother to kill her with a knife. This is like the saddest part. I mean, this is, again, like, how is this not harder to watch than the cat died? Right. Like, this is one million times worse because, like, the mom, like, in in their, like, twisted brain, you know, the twisted brain world that they're in, she sees Aisha but she looks like a like a horrendous creature and to know that that was her daughter and then like she snaps out of it after she's stabbed Aisha and it's so sad cuz now she's calling for an ambulance and she's like and Aisha says can you get me a band-aid and it's just <laughs> so sad i feel so bad for this mom i mean obviously i feel bad for Aisha but like that mom's going to have the worst life now now everybody thinks she killed her daughter i mean and she did which is so sad <laughs> And, like, the whole community now has made up a story. That she was crazy. You know? Well, right. And we don't know exactly what happened with the mom. And I, and I like that in this movie. We've, we've seen her crying. Like, maybe she's, a, you know, in some kind of funk, like, deep depression. And we've seen pictures of the father. So what happened to him? Did he abandon them? Like, what's going on? We don't know. Um and so the story that the community makes up is, you know, she was not doing well. She had a lot of depression and it's horrible. But like, of course, no one's going to assume that she was like hypnotized into doing this. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's insane. So that's the story that they make up. And I feel like that's the kind of story that you might hear when you're a kid. Because mm -hmm. Ida says, you'd never do that to us. Right, Dad? You know, the dad's like, oh, my God, of course not. But how would you know yeah. if you're a kid? Now we're in a world where parents can kill children? Like, what the hell? Yeah. Like. Yeah. And somebody that they knew, too, is, like, so horrible. A stranger follows Ida, Anna, and their father, suggesting Ben is, is yeah. Oh, that's kind of scary. Yes. He's just kind of trailing see, behind them. It's kind of, um. Bo is afraid vibes like oh, I haven't um, seen that movie yet. Oh, there's just like this part where Bo is trying to get back to his like apartment complex, and like these people are trying to get in, and there's like this one guy guy who just, uh, <laughs> keeps trying to like break in. It's really scary, oh, and that's what's going on here too. So, and then the stranger kind of like comes out of it. He's like, "What am I doing?" Like, yeah, because so he's like banging on the spooky wall too. Later, Ida invites Ben out to play with a toy glider, and they agree to go to a higher spot in order to launch it. Very clever. <laughs> At the highway overpass where the bully was killed, Ben climbs up to throw the glider, and Ida moves forward to push him over. A woman on a bicycle yells at Ben to get down, but Ida pushes him over the wall. Ben falls onto the grassy area next to the road and appears to be in a trance. Ida runs off, but realizes she is under Ben's control when her surroundings become dark and she sees the snake again. She runs into the road and breaks her leg when she's hit by a car. Ben simultaneously wakes up screaming. Back home, Ida is fearful Ben will use her mother in retaliation, so locks herself in the bathroom. I thought this scene was so great because we don't know this, but it's like, like Ida's looking outside and then she looks at her mom who's cutting something and then just turns yes. to her holding up the knife. But it's like, we don't know if she was going to do anything. And I remember having these thoughts as a kid sometimes of just like, when you just get an image like that in your head, you're just so suspicious. Like, cause you're mm -hmm. like, like you said, in this world, in her world now, this moms can kill their daughters. So, you know, now my mom's holding a knife. Like, I just thought that was really well done. Yeah. Her mother leaves the apartment to go to the store. When Ida leaves the bathroom, Anna is also gone. Anna has gone outside where, her, where she and Ben face each other across a large pond. They affect their surroundings with telekinesis, and Ben overpowers Anna 
causing her to fall down. I like it that like all the babies are crying. Mm -hmm. Like they're affected by all this like energy, this like conflict energy, you know, that's in the atmosphere. And of course the adults are like, Oh, you know, (laughs) He's, he's cranky, you know, yeah. he didn't get his nap. You're like, of course, you would try to make sense of whatever's going on. And the only way that you can as an adult who doesn't understand that there is magic, you know? Mm-hmm. So um, then uh, bah, bah, Ida loses her crutch trying to get down the stairs. And she, um, she's got a cast on her leg and she screams out and explodes her cast discovering now she has telekinesis the battle between anna and ben intensifies babies cry dogs bark waves form ida joins anna while some of the nearby children begin to watch from the playground and apartment balconies ida and anna hold hands and ben becomes visibly weak a metal swing set buckles and ben sits into the tire swing eventually there's a big burst of energy which causes things nearby to fall over At the same time, Ben is killed by the burst and his body goes limp in the swing. The children who were watching go back to their games and homes. That's part of me. Like, this is where I really felt bad for Ben because people just walk by him and he's just like slumped Mm -hmm. over. And like, you just realize that there's nobody even looking for him. You know, like he's like, nobody's going to wonder where he is. Like, that's horrible. You know, he is still a child. Yeah. And I mean, his only parent presumably is dead. So yeah. Ida and Anna go back to the apartment. Their mother returns and Ida gives her a big hug while Anna plays with her scribble board. Anna then pauses as if she's about to write something. You don't know how I feel about that last Mm, scene. (laughs) It's just like, Oh boy, it's cured. The issue, your problem. It's like, it's not a problem to be solved. Right. Yeah. It's been thinking about it a lot and I'm not sure how else if he wanted to do this thing with Aisha, you know, having this like psychic connection with Anna, I'm not sure how else he could have done it. Um, But yeah, it's It's kind of not very compassionate. Well, but I don't know. I, I do like it that the parents are sort of not great around her autism. Cause I think that's real. Yeah. Um, I, I just feel like it's not, the movie doesn't present it as a critique on those kinds of parents. Like, I feel like it's just straight faced. Like, like though she is not necessarily like a sweet moment when the parents are like, fawning over her newfound abilities it's like it's like i don't i don't know like i i just feel like this is more from the perspective this feels like it was written for parents who have children with special needs who don't like that like you know i I feel like it's not written with the actual people who have those needs in mind Mm. it's more like Mm -hmm. doesn't it suck people who have to deal with this Wouldn't, wouldn't this be great Whereas like, it's like, well, no, this doesn't happen in real life. And there are, and will still be people who are like Anna in the world. And they deserve our respect, even if they cannot speak, you know, like, yeah. yeah. And those people do exist, and they will exist. And it's like, I'm, I have never taken care of somebody who has, I've never taken care of another human, period. So it's like, I cannot speak on the difficulties that I know must exist, but it's like at the same time, those people are people though. And like, you know, you have to, you have to meet that person where they're at, you know, like on a, we, I I think the thing that gets me is like the glass in the shoe instance. It's like, she was tapping her foot. It's like, she is communicating something and that is not respected by her family. It's only when she can not even, utter words. Not even like not even not noticed. even like yeah, or like seen as like communication in any way. Yeah, it's just like this thing that she's doing right now. Who knows what it's all about? And it's like there's no attempt to understand. Yes, 
what's going on with her. Exactly. And like, that's the issue I have is that you can, you can have in your movie that this person can communicate, but that nobody will respect it unless it's the way that they communicate. And well, even with the, even with the, she, she likes to play with this um, pot lid and like make it spin and like that rattling sound that it makes when it's settling. And then we see at one point she can actually continue, make it continue spinning. And the mom just walks by. Like the sound is completely different. Even if you were just listening to the 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 pan lid like mm-hmm. settling, it's the same sound over and over and over. And now the sound is different and nobody notices. Yeah. And like that's and amazing. I feel like I feel like it is a critique of these parents, you know, um, these people in this family who have decided that she is a certain way and haven't investigated like that she has power, that she can communicate, you know, in nonverbal ways. So I guess I disagree with you because I think it is a critique of these parents. But um, what about because they're so oblivious to her? I feel like, Ida now being nice to Anna is presented as like a sweet thing and not like, like, I feel like there's no, and I know Ida of course is a child, but it's like, there's no irony or like discourse about the fact that once she learns, she can speak and feel things from somebody else conveying it. She's totally like, I like my sister now. Whereas before she only had like disdain for her and her existence. I don't know. I think if, if wanting to give a more generous like interpretation of it, you could have, you could say that she didn't know, like she really thought that she couldn't feel pain. Yeah. Like she even points it out to Ben. She's like, look at this. Like, and he's like, are you pinching her hard? And she's like, yeah you know, try it yourself kind of thing. But then when Aisha tells her she's crying on the inside, I, that's pretty fucking deep. Well, no. And I like anything like that, but that's not what I'm saying. It's like Aisha can convey that. And I think that's sweet because that reminds me of if there were somebody who that seems grounded in reality that you could have a kid have somebody who maybe works with somebody with special needs say to them like, well, actually your sister can feel this on the inside, but it's like, she's so excited to show her parents that Anna can speak. And now she's like happily bringing her places because she has like powers, but it's like, Mm -hmm. I, I really don't feel like there's respect for her or like that's, that's not necessarily resolved to me. I don't know. I feel like now that she has this information that I think she legitimately did not have before that, you know, she's not unlike you. She's exactly like you. She feels pain. She gets sad. And in fact, she's got a bravery and a courage that you don't even possess, you know, in your, you know, so I I think that's maybe where the respect is coming from. But I'm not, I mean, I don't think, I think it's pretty awkward. And I think I'm being really generous to the writer. I, I wish, I wish the parts about the translation and, and the acknowledgement that she's a full person could have been done differently. Yeah, I, I guess I personally, I do feel like you're being a little bit generous to them. It's like, <laughs> I understand what you're saying, but I feel like there's a difference between like reading it that way and like just the way it's presented in the movie, you know? And I I feel like it's not, it's a just, again, it's like, I don't hate this movie and I don't even hate every part about this character. I just feel like the whole speaking stuff, you just cut it out, you know? Could have been done better. Yes, but but <laughs> I sure. I don't hate the film at all, and that's not me being like this is evil or anything. I'm like that's just the one thing I thought could have been a little bit better. Yeah, Aisha's skin disorder is called vitiligo. Um, it occurs when there's a loss of melanocytes, pigmented cells in the skin. Actress Mina Yasmin Braseth Ashheim has this condition in real life. 
At the end of the movie, it says, Ingen Darbel Skadet under Produktionen. This means no animals were harmed during production to English speaking viewers <laughs> that may be concerned. <laughs> what does Letterboxd have to say about it? Um, Tobias uh, Widean gave it four and a half stars. What a fucking gut punch. So creepy, so affecting, and so genuine. Not only have Eskil Vogt managed to tell an amazing layered story, but he also did it from the rare perspective of children and managed to capture that childlike innocence like very few movies before. Huge shout out to all the child actors as well. Great performances all around. And um, uh, Tobias has been featured on the podcast before. He and his sister, Rebecca, um, do a podcast called The Spoiler Cast. Oh. Um, Amber Haley, I don't think that's how you say his name. It's Mitch from Drag Mitch to Hell. Oh. Um, gave it four and a half stars. <laughs> really effective with some truly unsettling moments. A great lesson in restraint. Really shows how horrific you can make something without jump scares and monsters. Though you could argue this film has its own kind of monsters. Children. What? <laughs> and Stefan McDonald gave it four stars. Expert direction and acting all around. The way the movie chooses to slowly explore the new faculties the children possess is a great example of strong storytelling. Some genuinely scary beats. I do have to say this was a hard watch at the beginning due to animal violence, but I'm glad I stuck through it. Me too, Stefan. Vivian gave it five stars. An elegant horror with a lot of heart. Feeling sad for all the children who feel so many, who feel so much emotions, but have no healthy place to put them. That's, I guess, what I was feeling before. Yeah. But Jane, 3083, gave it a half star. Fellas, are we portraying a child with an intellectual disability like this in 2023? I am profoundly offended by this and I'm absolutely astonished at all these supposedly very socially conscious people pumping it up. F off. Underscore vexation. Give it a half star. Awesome movie, but rating a half star because of the cat. Okay. Like, see, that's <laughs> and, dramatic. Yeah. And Odgers gave it half star warning. Do not buy <laughs> X-Men first class from shine. Just wasted an hour of my life on this lifeless POS. Damn. Damn is right. What phobia is that? We've had this phobia before. Ilurophobia is fear of cats. And pedophobia is fear of babies and small children. Okay, let's rate this in... Rocks? Rocks. I would I would t- tell a kinetically throw four rocks for this movie (laughs) (laughs) at children all right at at children just Um, kidding all right well i gave it four and a half on letterboxd and i stand by that rating what have we learned man kids model behavior so if you're upset at a child remember that's just a child they really don't know what they're doing let's think about why they're doing this thing doesn't make it okay but they still have a chance to be better i mean i think i learned or or slash remembered that children are fucking disgusting (laughs) and quite scary yeah but also magical (laughs) i don't miss being a kid i don't i mean you couldn't i mean no Mm mm-mm no, I don't. And that's one thing I, 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 I uh, groove with a uh, vote over. He says he, do- he doesn't feel nostalgia over childhood and n- nor do I at all. It's like, there's so many cool things about being an adult. Great. There are a lot of bad things, but like so many things, I mean, I guess just you're not as powerless. I, I mean, like money can't buy that. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure some people have happy childhoods and 
more power to you, but. But also you I shouldn't didn't. wish that you were still there. Like, I don't think that's good behavior well, for what anybody. It, that's a separate conversation for another day. But I mean, what, <laughs> is there a limit or like, do you, do you feel uncomfortable about people who I don't like, we used to know somebody when we both lived in Raleigh, who was an adult friend of mine, adult friend of mine, who was really into like teenage stuff. Oh, and oh. I don't think I remember that's... you and I just sort of being like, uh, you're 40. Like, mm. I guess I feel differently about that now. It's like, I think as long as you're not stepping, like if you're, if you're in a space for children, understand uh-huh. that, you know, it's like, you know, if you're, I know this isn't what the specific example, but like, you know, let's say it's like a K-pop group or something. If mostly kids are going there, like uh, respect that, you know, you're in a space that's meant for children, but I don't think that, uh-huh. I think I now maybe disagree. It's like, I think a lot of people have horrible childhoods. And if there's something that makes you feel any sort of like glee now as an adult, I think it's fair. I say this just as somebody who I feel like I've turned around and now I'm just into the same things I was when I was a kid. So that would mm-hmm. disclude me from that too. So I can't be hypocritical. Yeah. I don't know. I'll check in with you again <laughs> when you're, when you're 40, you know, and see if you feel the same way. I will say I mean, this I'd... person is a specific case because I think anything they're into, it would have been cringy from their behavior. <laughs> maybe, maybe so. I mean, I think there's a big, there's a big chain. There's a big span between 27 and like 42 or whatever so i'm just like but um i don't know i'm not the boss so i mean do whatever you want (laughs) would we watch it again yes but give me a few months (laughs) did you have a favorite scene i don't know i can't think of one off the top it's like it's not that i don't have a favorite scene i guess it's just like i will say for me i think this whole movie like I enjoyed it, but I don't think it I it was enjoyable. You know, it's like it just made me really yeah. sad. But I think it did yeah. a good job. And I think this is I think it's a story worth being told. But um I, there wasn't any part that I was like, Yippee, I love this. <laughs> There's a shot we didn't talk about in the beginning that I really like where I think it I think we're supposed to think that it's Aisha kind of like astral projecting herself Mm. like around the complex and i think it's a drone shot because Bo was talking about using drones in a different way than most people use drones and it's upside down oh yeah that was beautiful yeah yeah really cool the cinematography in this like all his films is just like great really amazing who wins the you fool award ben Ben or Ben's mom. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I guess Ben's mom is like she's the true person at fault here. Don't 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 be a don't be don't be don't be cruel to your kid, man. Yeah, like, they might just pour boiling hot dog water on you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the fact that it was hot dog water is is like an extra <laughs> punch. I know we didn't mention that wohos, but water and a bunch of hot dogs come out of the pot, so she was just boiling hot dogs. Imagine your kid yeah. dumps boiling hot dog water on you. Mm. There's some rough stuff in this film. Not gonna the smell sugarcoat alone. it. That's what I always think. Like when there's a body for like days like that, I'm just like, it would smell so bad. Who's not like knocking on that door being like, hello, you got a dead body in there? Well, a lot of people are not there. That's so. true. Okay. The the superintendent's going to have, like, a hell of a weekend. I mean, yeah, but, I mean, if Ben hadn't died, um, she would have been discovered any any day, you know? Yeah. So, but anyway, thank you so much, Mac, for having this conversation of with course. me. Of course. It was lovely. About loss of innocence films. <laughs> fun topic. <And> thank you. <laughs> Real fun. Thank you, Wohos, for joining us for this episode and for all your support it means the world of horror to us truly next time we're going to be looking at a couple of movies about mental health with the babadook from australia and jacob's ladder from the u.s 
If you are enjoying the podcast, please tell all your friends all about us. And remember, Wohos, we love you and don't go into the basement. <laughs>